biochemistry and biocatalysis. This group's research centers on chemistry, chemical understanding and exploitation of biomolecule function with an emphasis on carbohydrates and proteins. In 2003, he was named among the top young innovators in the world by Technology Review, MIT's magazine of innovation in the TR35 award, and was a finalist in the BBSRC Innovator of the Year competition in 2010. And everyone, please join me in welcoming Professor Ben Davies. Thank you very much. It's wonderful to be here. Can someone just grab the lights? I think the switch might be there by the curtains on the wall. Yeah, um, so it's wonderful to be here. Actually, I think this is the first yeah. time uh, I've ever been inside Trinity. <laughs> I've been here for almost 30 years. Or so um, it's a, a wonderful setting. So I'm delighted to talk to you about, about this stuff. I'm going to start by thanking some of the people who've helped us on this journey, on the three stories I'm going to talk about tonight. Um, the three projects I'm going to talk about are all really the product of work done just by three PhD students, each of whom were associated with each of the projects I'm going to talk about. Uh, the project on TB was done by a, a wonderful graduate student called Carrie Ann Backus, uh, she's now um, a professor at UCLA. Uh, uh, the work that I'm going to talk to you about cell walls and how we can start to interfere with cell walls and bacteria was done by a great student called Lin Bing Kong. He's now an academic a professor in Japan. Uh, and then the work that I'm going to talk about at the end, um, this work on trying to build an artificial cell, was done by a fantastic graduate student called Paul uh, Gardner, who went on to become uh, chief patent examiner um, in Australia. And a lot of this work has been done in collaboration with people. And two people I really want to thank in particular um, are Hagen Bailey, a, a wonderful collaborator in the chemistry department, and also Liz Carpenter, a crystallographer up in the Structural Genomics Consortium. And we work very closely on some aspects of this work. So, sugar and dirt, this quote, I'm going to explain a little bit about where this quote comes from. The world is made of sugar and dirt. And this comes from a, a novel... Um, it's actually quite famous in Germany, but not so much outside of, of Germany. It's one called Berlin Alexanderplatz, written by someone called Alfred Berlin. It often regularly features in the top ten of, of German novels. In a way, it's sort of the German equivalent of Ulysses, and it features this uh, remarkable uh, character who goes through uh, several mishaps called Franz Biberkopf. Uh, and all the way through, um, good things happen to him and bad things happen to him. Some of the bad are things like you know, loses an arm and then he loses a leg and so forth. But um, every time something good or bad happens, he uses this phrase, the world is made of sugar and dirt, basically saying there's some good stuff and there's some bad stuff. And so today I'm going to talk to you about the sugars, which is the good stuff, and the dirt, um, which is the bad stuff. The dirt that I'm thinking about are the interactions of the good stuff, sugars, with bacteria, the dirt. Uh, the dirt that we find around us. And all three of those stories have those uh, two features in common, sugars and bacteria. So I'm going to start off with a little bit of a primer. I'm going to start by focusing on the first two stories, which relate to trying to understand pathogenic forms of bacteria and how we can think about new ways of seeing them, of diagnosing infections, and treating infections potentially by thinking about their sugars and how sugars are involved in those pathogenic species. And I'm going to start, I realise I have quite a mixed audience, so for some of you this will be really super basic, but for some of you it will be new. I'm going to start by explaining some of the nomenclature, some of the symbols that you'll see. And I'm going to start with sugars. Uh, and this is a structure of the archetypal sugar, which is glucose, and uh, as chemists we tend to draw um, molecules in this way, where we represent, for example, oxygen and hydrogen often explicitly, but carbon is often taken for granted, so any corner any vertex that you see, any corner that you see in these systems, tends to be a saturated carbon. So if you just see a bond between uh, two carbons, you see it just as this line. So that tells you how organic chemists think about it. Carbon is often assumed at those corners. And so explicitly, these would be the atoms in a carbon-carbon bond, but you'll see it drawn instead like that. So that gives you a sense of the structure that I'm going to be talking about today. I'm going to start off quite slowly, and then I'm going to go into some of the hardcore research that we've done using these types of symbols. So, one of the remarkable things about glucose as a molecule, one of the incredible things about its chemistry, is it can be um, quixotic. You can have various different characters chemically. Uh, it can either be a, a, cyclic, a cyclical structure, as I just showed you before, 
or it can open itself up into a chain. And one of the ways that it does that is by breaking a bond, often dynamically, uh, to create an aldehydic structure, and then that chain can undergo various transformations in terms of its shape, so it can open up to what we often refer to as a linear structure. And so it's important to remember that glucose that we take and eat and use is often morphing itself from one structure to another, cyclical, linear, and all of the chemistry that goes with those different forms. In some cases, the aldehyde is present. In some cases, the aldehyde is masked. And one of the things that we tend not to be aware of is just how abundant sugars are. So we think about organic chemistry all the time. If you ask people about organic chemistry, they might think of the petroleum industry and the things we make from that, and plastics and so forth. But actually, the most abundant form of organic chemistry on the planet is glucose, locked up inside plants. In these strings of glucose, the polymers of glucose, a polymer refers to taking a unit and then stringing together many copies of that unit to make a longer chain, and a polymer of glucose is found in cellulose. And cellulose is found, for example, in the cell walls of many, many plants. And so there's a huge amount of glucose locked up in those sugary strings that we find all around us. If only we could think about ways of using this more efficiently, then all of the world's problems uh, would in part be solved, and that's a, perhaps a topic for a lecture on another day. And one of the interesting things about sugars is that even small changes can make uh, really quite drastic um, differences in their properties. So let's take an example. This sugary string, this polymer, is almost identical to the one I just showed you, almost identical to cellulose. This is referred to as chitin. And the only change is that one of the hydroxyl groups, one of the OHs, has been converted to this blue group, this acetamide, and it converts cellulose from this thing we find in plant cell walls, malleable enough for plants to grow and do stuff, into something that is basically an arm or a shield that we find in certain sea animals and insects as well. So one change, small change in one of the units, but then polymerized that change throughout the sugary stream can make a massive difference in terms of the properties, for example, as a material, as something that's hard. And so that's one of the remarkable things about sugars. Subtle changes make a massive difference. Uh, and they're pervasive in biology everywhere. We tend not to think about them very much. So those are the sugars. And what about the dirt? Well, the dirt I'm going to focus on today um, is the dirt that is represented by bacteria. You'll see this little symbol of bacteria throughout my talk. And this is actually a more uh, representative image of, of a bacterium. This is a micrograph, electron micrograph, of the surface of a bacteria. And there's the cell wall. And there's all this kind of hair sticking out from the surface of it. And I'll come back to that in a few slides time. And that hair represents sugars growing out of the surface of bacteria. There's a huge amount of sugar on the surface of both. And often the sugars we find are highly unusual. And that gives us a way of thinking about how bugs work and what they do with them. And that will really be the focus. Bacteria, bugs, love sugars. They use them. They make very unusual versions of sugars. Uh, and that's something that has fascinated me for, for decades. So if we look more closely in a cartoon form at this cell wall in a typical bacterium, um, you can see there are all sorts of different structures some of them are represented here as this oval, which is a protein, but many of them are uh, carbohydrates, different strings of carbohydrates, and one of them that I'll come back to later creates a capsule, a shield to the bug, and so bugs are very dependent on the sugars that they use. And we often find proteins and sugars combined together to make hybrids, in this case we refer to glycoproteins, and those two can be important. Now, proteins are pervasive in biology. I've talked about sugars, but proteins are really the things that do stuff in biology. They are the workers. They make and break bonds, they move stuff, they can act as machines. They are the heart of biology. DNA is the information. Sugars, well, we can discuss what they do, they do a lot. But proteins tend to be the catalysts um, and the things that manipulate stuff. And proteins themselves are polymers, but very subtle polymers. Not polymers made up of the same thing repeated, but variations on a theme. And the variation is this kind of polypeptidic structure where the side chains are varied. And, and, and nature has come up with wonderful ways of programming different sequences within those polymers. And so you can take a variety of amino acids, there are 20 proteinogenic amino acids, and they can be combined by nature in all sorts of different permutations. So you can work out straight away there are incredible numbers of permutations. So amino acids, so there's the amino, there's the acid part, 
and this bit in the middle is the variation, this bit is conserved, and we then polymerize using the amine and the acid, we make what's called a peptidic link, this is an amide bond, and we keep going. And as we do, we go up in scale, amino acids, peptides, polypeptides. Polypeptides become even larger at some point, we arbitrarily call them proteins. Then they start to fold around and do stuff. They've got secondary structure, tertiary structure, quaternary structure. And when they've folded around, they then take on remarkable properties, such as the ability to make and break bonds, lowering transition states. And one of the nice things about, I've always liked about enzymology, unlike other bits of chemistry, we tend to name the proteins that make and break bonds, the catalysts, very, very simply. So those that chew up proteins are called proteases. Those that chew up lipids are called lipases. And um, a friend of mine always used to refer to it. Those that would bind the bus would be referred to as bus aces. It's a very simple nomenclature. And so today you're going to see them more typically represented in these type of cartoon structures where we show them. beta sheets as these kind of flat sheet like structures you can see in alpha helix. And these are so called secondary structural motifs. And those come together to make the tertiary structure and so forth. And so you'll see this cartoon like representation as well in my slides today. So, real bonds, <coughs> but also cartoons. But underpinning those cartoons are these bonds. So don't forget that this is all covalent chemistry. So these are one of the, this is one of the bugs that I'm going to talk about. And actually, this is the bug here. It's uh, Mycobacterium tuberculosis. And it's bursting out of this uh, human cell or macrophage. And TB is something that everyone's heard about. But actually, when you think about it, it's, um, it's a remarkable bug. It's fascinating. But it is a a worrying bug. Um, people often dwell on figures around mortality. Uh, between a million and three million people die per year from TB. We tend not in the developed world to care about that as we should. Basically, the most of the people don't die in the developed world. You turn a blind eye. There may be some multiply resistant strain pop up and we get worried for a few weeks and then we stop. And so whilst people dwell on mortality, they don't tend to think of the implications of what might happen if all forms of TB became existent. And one useful fact to emphasize that is that it's estimated that something like uh, a third of the world is infected with TB. So maybe this bit. <laughs> and um, we don't know. We don't know whether it's a third, a half, 10, 20 percent. But it's a lot of people. Partly because many people, especially in countries where you have good health care, um, their well-fed, good nutrition will be infected. And then it will lie dormant in them all of their life, and then they'll die. We won't see the symptoms. But it could affect a lot of people. And so one thing that I think we've needed to do for a long time is to work at how we can track your CTV. Even when you know someone has TV, try to treat them as it's very, very tough. Um, often one or two years worth of treatment with three or four different drugs in combination. If you stop treatment very quickly, it switches to resistant form. It's very hard to follow a TB infection in humans. And so that's one of the problems that we've tried to wrestle with. So how can you see a bug, not only in a culture, pick it out from one cell amongst others, but also in context, when it's uh, jumped inside a cell as it has done here. How can we paint a bug in a selective way, knowing this is TB in a background of lots of other cells, possibly other bacteria, but certainly in the background of other human cells and other host cells. So one of the ways that we've done this classically is through so-called acid-fast staining. This is a very crude way of doing things. The waxy coat of TB absorbs certain dyes, uh, such as this red dye here, and then many of the bacteria, when you wash acid over them, that dye washes out. TB is so waxy that it doesn't. So what you have to do is culture sputum over often days, even weeks, and then stain some of them, and some of them kind of stay red. And that has been one of the standard methods. It's still the standard method in many UK hospitals. Um, the, the gold standard method for diagnosis is typically through radiography, You're taking some form of a chest x-ray, but this is tough. Uh, this is an example, we do a, a lot of this work in collaboration with NIH and Bethesda uh, on a Gates, -funded, a Gates Foundation funded project, uh, and this actually comes from a patient, uh, and it highlights the problem. So this is a chest x-ray, you look at this and you say, ah, yeah, there's a lesion there. It turned out in this unfortunate patient, that wasn't a lesion, that was a tumour in the lung, and actually the lesion from tuberculosis, which they, they found out later, was over in this lung. And it, highly, it highlights the, the problems that you have. You look at this and you really are just guessing in the shadows. So how can we think about doing this in a perhaps more sophisticated way? Now the problem is even more complex than that, because if you get infected by a bug like TB, it jumps inside your cells. It doesn't just float around, but it jumps inside your cells. And typically it jumps inside the cells that are there to try and deal with infection. 
the cells associated with the numerous spots, dendritic cells, T cells. And they can hide inside those and basically do nothing for a long time. And then, for reasons we don't really understand, suddenly vroom, it can revert to an active form of pop up more and we really don't understand what that is. And so if you're going to look for TB, you can't just look for TB floating around in your blood, you have to look for it inside human cells. Um, and not only inside human cells, we have to look for it inside people, inside humans. And so the problem isn't just this, but the problem is doing it in this context, and ideally in this context. And that's where we're moving towards um, with some of our work. So, how to paint a bug in a selected way. We want to do this so it's just TB. Like, we're full of bugs. Bugs in our guts, all sorts of different cells. You can't use something that is common to it. We have to use something that is selective. And the two things that we've exploited are two old aspects of the science of TB. One referred to as antigen 85, and one that's called cord factor. And both of them are found in the cell wall, the outer surface of the body. So the outer cell wall of TB is weird. It's unlike very many other bugs, and that gives us a handle, that gives us a, a point of uniqueness that we can exploit. So here's the normal outer cell wall, and then stacked on top of that in TB is a waxy coat that I've talked about before. And that's made up of very unusual sugars. Some of them have lipids hanging off them, and then interdigitated into those lipid side chains, into this grease, is some more grease that's made up of these things here. But we've kind of got sugars just kind of dissolved in a wax made up of other sugars, and then some protein sat on the surface. <coughs> and many of these are unique to TB. One of them is a protein called antigen 85, and this manipulates some of these sugars and their lipids on the surface. In fact, it's the most abundant protein on the surface of TB, there's lots of it, so abundant that when they took ground up TB and inoculated rabbits, the antigen, antigenic response was huge and they called it antigen 85. And so that's to this protein. It tells you how much of that there is. And that's an enzyme that's catalyzing the manipulation of bonds, the attachment of lipids to some of these sugars. And so what this enzyme does is it shuffles lipids up and down this purple disaccharide. So these are two, this is two units of glucose linked together in a very unusual way. One, one. It's a sugar called trahalose. Uh, linked face to face, and it manipulates lipids, bolts them on to these purple sugars. And uh, that gives rise to the other thing that we've exploited, which is cord factor, which turns out to be this bislipidated version of this purple sugar. And we've known for 130, 140 years that somehow this extract leads to this cord like structure in cultures of TB. And it's important to virulence. We don't really know why, but it's important. It's on the surface of bugs. And so these two things, antigen 85 and cord factor, came together to give us an idea about how we might paint bugs. And so this is the idea. So this enzyme catalyzes the attachment of grease onto this sugar. And so we thought, if we could feed people this without grease, and that doesn't dissolve in the bugs on its own, if we could feed that to people, it wouldn't be touched by anything in your body. It turns out that this sugar is pretty unique to tuberculosis. You don't need it, I don't need it, we don't have enzymes to deal with it. So you could give it to a healthy person, give them something like this, and it just floats through their body. It wouldn't do anything. But we thought if we took a version that had paint on it, some form of molecular paint, then a painted version in unhealthy people would float through the body, eventually bump into the cell wall of TB, and only there it would then be. Uh, lipidated, made waxy, and effectively end up being a sort of self-painting mechanism for TB. So something that's got paint on it, something that's recognized, the bug would selectively take it, put lipids onto it, and dissolve it into its own coat. It would paint itself with this label sugar. And healthy people would see nothing at all. So that was the idea. Of it. How to make a paint based on trahalo. So the first idea that we explored to achieve this was to use radioactivity. A molecular paint is something you want to see. And you want to see inside stuff and radioactivity is the way of doing it. Carbon-14 is a very long-lived isotope, thousands of years, people don't like using it, and so you can never put this into people, but it's a good starting point. So we can make something that was uh, isotopically painted, but that we could use to test proofs of principle, as it were. And so we started there, and there's a lot of information on the slide, you don't need to worry about it too much, but this is a, a radio TLC, radio chromatogram, that shows us that if we take radioactive trahalos and we feed it, then 
we can, in bugs, put a lipid onto it and change its structure, put that paint into a wax form. And even more importantly, if we then took that radio labeled trahalose and fed it to cultures of human cells, in this case macrophages, that are infected with TB, those cells would take up our radioactive sugar, put wax onto them, and boom, paint themselves. And do it in a way that was dependent on infection. Uninfected cells don't paint themselves, infected cells work. So straight away we knew this might be a good idea. The next step was to try and find something that would work as a real paint. We can't bang around with carbon 14 in the lab too much, unfortunately. And so we thought about how antigen 85 puts waxy lipids onto this structure. How can we play with that? And what we wanted to do was to take that native structure and make an unnatural version that had a different type of a label. One type of label that we can see in life, in this case a fluorophore. And so we've made lots of different versions. We've made over 200 unnatural trihaloses. We've played all sorts of tricks in putting them together. And we've assembled many of those with chemistry. And I'm going to show you some hardcore organic synthetic chemistry now. Because people often don't do this, but you should know the pain of synthetic chemistry. Now this to them is, is sculpture. So this to them is, is art, um, certainly to me. And so one way that we can make an artificial sugar is to make and break bonds using chemistry ourselves. And let me show you a brief snippet of that. So we can use chemical transformation to make this unnatural intermediate, one copy of glucose, and we can protect it. This is a strategy often used in chemistry, where we block off every single reactive group in that structure, leaving one free to direct the chemistry to that site in the sugar. And we use that in this in this case, we want to strap it together with another version of almost glucose. This is a slightly challenged version of glucose. So two units of glucose, and we want to link them from that site to that site. So we do the same here, and we block that off. And therefore, the two orange sites can come together under certain forms of chemistry. We glue them together to make a trahalose analog. And in this case, we take off all of those protecting groups. So we create an unprotected kin, leaving one group that can be selectively reacted with in this case, we used to put on a fairly standard fluorophore. This is something you shine light on, it gets excited, and then it emits light in a slightly different way. A very powerful way of seeing stuff. So we made this. So it's got the trahalose core, but it's got this big, flashy thing hanging on the side. But we knew from the enzyme crystal structure that this probably would be tolerated by that same enzyme, antigen 85. So we can take this, and to cut a long story short, when we feed it to bugs, they light up like a crystal. It works when we show this compound of bugs. They're painting themselves. We can see that in the same types of chromatogram that I showed you before here. Instead of using radioactivity, we're now using light. And we can see it in a more benign way. And we can check that this is due to all of the parts that we need to be specific. So this is good light emission. When we keep treat the bugs, when they're dead, when their enzymes are dead, nothing happens. So they need to be alive. They need to have that enzyme active for painting. If we take another sugar, we make this glucose or something else that doesn't have this selectivity for trahalose, it doesn't work. So it's not just a question of sugar going in. And if we take a range of other bugs that you would find in the lung, it doesn't work either. They don't have that enzyme, Manson 85, so we have a way of not only selectively painting bugs, but in a way that won't interfere with natural processes and other infections. This is TB and nothing else when you see green. So the idea was to then take that forwards. Can we see the same green bugs inside human cells, macrophages inside culture? And the answer is yes. And we can do that in various different ways, different forms of microscopy. And in some cases, and hopefully I'll just draw the curtains a little bit so you can see this more clearly, um, in some cases we can do that at quite high resolution. So this is a movie of basically flying over a rusted version of a cell in culture. Um, there are four different colours being used here. The green, of course, is our paint. Red is a fluorescent protein that's being expressed inside the middle of the bugs. The blue refers to nuclei found in human cells, and these bugs are sitting inside those human cells. And then the purple refers to an antibody that's been labeled that's picking up on a structure that's developed inside human cells. So we're doing four color microscopy to see this stuff, and importantly to see our paint in action. Paint bugs selectively. And as we fly over the surface, you can see that we have painted just the surface and not the middle. And interestingly, some bugs are active and some bugs aren't, and those that are inactive, which appear to be dormant, appear to be the ones inside certain structures. And so by using this paint and combining it with microscopy, we can fly over the surfaces of human cells and see how bugs are working and try to unpick their mechanism and also tell you whether you have TB or not. 
So that's the idea. So we can do that, and we can do it in cells. You've seen that. But we can't do it in people, at least not yet. Light microscopy inside people, that depth is not yet with us, maybe one day. So how do we get inside people? And the answer is to go back to something that we explored before, but in a different way. Back to radioactivity. But to use a form of radioactivity that can be seen more precisely and has a shorter half-life. It decays quickly and therefore there is no longer uh, the potential hazard that comes from that. And one source of radioactivity that does this in a beautiful way is an isotope of fluorine. Normally fluorine is 19F, but we can take an isotope of fluorine, slight difference in mass, 18F, and that is unstable as a consequence, and it decays. And when it decays, it emits a positron, a form of antimatter. Yes, antimatter does exist, it doesn't exist for very long, it gets spat out from 18F, and when it hits an electron, it annihilates, and that annihilation leads to the emission of two gamma rays that you can see almost exactly at the same time at 180 degrees from each other. And so it's sort of like a telescope. It tells you pretty much where this is. It goes a little distance and then back. Matter, antimatter annihilation gives rise to energy that we can see. And we can use that to image very precisely where this thing is. It's amazing. The problem is it decays 50% in a couple of hours. So we have to move quickly and therefore... The benefit of that decay is also a challenge in chemistry. We've got to do stuff quickly. So the chemistry I showed you before is too slow. So to make it quicker, we use enzymes. Some of the people who work on those enzymes are in this room. And so what we can do is stack together those two halves of dryers from two units of glucose. One is one that's routinely used in hospitals up and down the lab. The most routinely used agents for radio imaging, in fact, in most hospitals. It's something called FEG. And we can take that and use it to build our new reagent, which we call FDT. So we can take an enzyme. Enzymes don't need protecting groups. They can pick out the right group. They do essentially the same coupling reaction we do with chemistry, but using enzymology. We can bolt it together with another unit of glucose and make this very simple clean molecule, where we've simply taken one hydroxyl to an 18F. And this is a reagent that we're now taking through to um, an IND for FDA approval this year in collaboration with it. So we really hope this will get into people a little bit soon. So it basically means in an hour, quick enough for the half-life, we get a pretty decent radio chemical meal. We can take stuff that you can buy, stuff you get in most hospitals, a couple of enzymes, boom, we can make this. And so this is something that could be distributed to various different hospitals up and down. Not only our land, but lands that probably need it more. So what does it do? This is some very early work. This actually comes from three or four years ago. Um, when we looked at infected rabbits. Rabbits are a reasonable model for TB. When we take an uninfected rabbit and we pump in this FDT, you can see it pass through the blood, it goes through the heart very quick, quickly, it clears from the lung region uh, into the kidneys and into the bladder. So it doesn't stick around if the animal is uninfected. And you can see this in a cross section. So that yellow represents where the activity is. We go through over time, the lungs clear. But if we take an infected animal, and bear in mind this is N equals 1, we've done this in multiple studies since, in different animal models of TB, what we start to see is the development of hot spots over time. This is an overhead view of the animal, this is a cross section through the lung, you can see that more clearly, and we see a relative hot spot there. Um, and it turns out, when we perform biopsies, uh, necropsies, you can see that, that that corresponds to a lesion. And in fact, in this infected animal, there turned out to be three lesions, two of which were active, that we could see, that were hot, and one was sealed off, necrotic, dead, the bugs were dead. And so this can even show you when the bacteria is still active. So we're using this not only to see TB infection, but to see how active it is, and how we kill it in certain ways. So we're hoping to take this through, as I say, to the clinic over the next few years. I'm going to change... Okay, and talk a little bit about this second story before I wrap up talking about um, artificial cells. This is something that many of you will have heard about now, that basically for 40 years, um, society, pharmaceutical industry, which is the way that we've chosen to discover the drugs that should save us, um, went to sleep. 40 odd years of no innovation because basically the, um, the free market model didn't work. <laughs> to put it one we can debate that in the question. When we did start again, when we realised there was a problem at the turn of the century, then one of the most disappointing things is that many of the targets that we've looked at since the advent of antibiotics, driven mainly uh, in hospitals around Oxford, um, we were looking at very much the same types of targets, disappointing. So, and there are other targets. Amongst those targets are unusual and unique sugars, as I've been showing you. 
One of the classical targets is peptidoglycan. In fact, the first rare antibiotics around the penicillins target peptidoglycan biosynthesis. And there are various other frontline antibiotics that still hit this kind of interest. We would do some work on actually this antibiotic. We've got a version of that coming up over the next few years. But there are other targets that we find in the cell walls of bacteria, and these have always been thought to be a bit more tough. This is in the inside cell wall. These are found in a more exposed outer cell wall portion. So it could be good targets, but have been hard to get at. And these targets um, are strongly antigenic. So what that means, if your immune system can get into this bit of the bug, then your immune system can pretty much deal with them. And I'll show you that in a second. So what's the problem? If this is in a bit, and then this is on top of this bit, then why can't our immune system get into it? Well, it turns out that on top of these sugars, there's no, yet another layer of sugars, uh, so-called catching of polysaccharide, CPS. So we have three layers of sugars, and we want to get into the middle one. So this is the stuff in the middle we want to get into. And what we find in bugs is this thing is basically creating a polymeric shield. It gets in the way. So you can see that in this micrograph. I showed you what a similar version of it. This hair is that shield, capsule of polysaccharide. Um, underneath is the layer we want to get to, and then underneath that's peptidoglycan. So we want to get into the blue stuff. If we could get your immune system to see the blue stuff, take away the hair, and make a bulbing bone, if you will, then we might be in with a chance. And this has not really been something that people have explored before. Now here's an example of a genetic knockout, and another genetic knockout when you take away these layers. And if you drop blood onto these, they don't. Baldy bugs are really hard, really unable to defend themselves against, very hard for them to defend themselves against your immune system. So let's try and think about a way of making bugs bald. Uh, that's the idea. So how do these sugars get put on the surface of bacterial cells? How do cells grow hair, as it were? Like? Um, we have some ideas, a lot of it's based on guesses and cartoons, these different layers, but there has been some incredible structural biology and one of the structures is basically this structure that sits between some of these layers and acts as a kind of conduit for the hair. It's like the follicle, if you like, for bacteria. And the structure of this was actually determined you know, 30 odd years ago by, by a, a brilliant structural biologist who's just moved to Oxford, actually, who works down the road at Harlem, a wonderful guy called Jim Nexon. And this thing is remarkable. This is the structure. This is what it looks like in reality. And it's a huge thing that sits between the two, and it looks like a bottle, right? And basically, that's what it is. This is a bottle made by nature. Eight copies of proteins come together to make a homo optima, and this thing is incredible. So this is something that nature uses to export these hairs, these sugars. And it's hollow. You look inside the bottle, and there's water. Right? Nature made this. Incredible. You flip the bottle over, and it has a valve in the bottom, where sugars are pumped in, and then go through the top. But we've only just begun to start to understand the mechanism of this. And then you strip away the surface, and you can see that's where the sugars can go, and then they get stuck onto the top somehow. And we decided to try and make a drug that would hit this, which in the field of medicinal chemistry, it was described to me as madness in reply to one draft proposal. Turns out it works. Um, so, how are we going to do it? So this is the idea. Stuff comes out, hair comes out, we want to block it. We want to basically try and find a, an assay system for working out whether it's pumping hair out or not set up some sort of biophysical experiment. We can do that at the single molecule level. I'll show you how we do that in a second. And then we want to basically make corks by making things that look like the hairs coming through. Corks for the bottle, that's the idea. Then put a cork in the bottle, you're exposing that middle layer, you've blocked the CPS coming out, expose LPS, and then your immune system can get in. And do so. That was the idea we wanted to explore. So how to create an asset? This is where we collaborate with Hayden Bailey. Uh, and we use a method called single channel recording, where we can basically put a small current across very, very low copy numbers of proteins down to the single molecule and see what flows through. So how is that relevant to what we're doing? Well, we can take very small amounts of protein and run them on some form of a gel, chromatogram. We can watch them assemble into the optima that we need. We can get one molecule of this optima. And then we can drop it into a lipid bilayer. So we insert the top of the bottle, and we think it does that in nature, into a lipid bilayer. And then we put it inside this apparatus. And inside this apparatus, we can put a potential difference, basically putting a voltage across it. And by virtue of this potential difference, ions in the buffer flow in different directions, and they carry a tiny, tiny current. 
And so that current, if you like, is a proxy for stuff going through, how open this is. So if you put a cork in the top, it will tell us because the current will go there. So if it's open, we have a larger current, we put a cork in, book, and it's blocked. You see it. Single molecule. So that was the idea. Um, so the next step was to design something that would go inside a cork. And how do we design a cork for a polysaccharide for a hair? And this took us a while to sort out. So this is a model of the hair coming through the bottle. And if you look down from on top, it forms this kind of helical shape, we think, through modeling. And if you look down on top, then it kind of looks like a, a circle. The kind of projection cross-section of a, of a helix is a circle. And what it is is basically a repeating unit of this tetrasaccharide. Repeat, 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 it makes a helix. And so if you take every single one of those sugars in the tetrasaccharide, color them, make this cartoon, take a cross-section, look from on top, it looks like a circle. I mean, of course, it's a projection, so it's a trick of the eye. But we thought, well, this is pretty much what must be interacting with the inside of the bottle as it's going through. So what if we actually just make a circle, a circle based on sugars, which we made synthetically, and use that as a cork that would sit, perhaps there, perhaps there, perhaps there. And it would have all the same interactions, because it's a sugar, and so it should bind tightly, um, but it's not natural, okay? It's a blocker, it's a cork. We screened... Many, we've got over 400 of these now. We picked out various hits that have common features, and I'm going to show you this one that turns out to be a great call. So this is the iron. Uh, this is the current that we get. This is the, um, the, the conductance. The iron is passing through the rice. It's very small current uh, in peak elements, and then when we drop in the inhibitor, boom, you can start to see these steps. And each one of these steps down is the bottle going in. Is the cork going into the bottle? Boom, sitting in and then coming out. Boom. And that's it. Single molecule events. One cork, one bottle, and we can see them. And we can take this gauge and we can get a quantitative analysis of binding constants. We can knock out the residues in the bottle using genetics to show us which ones are important. So you take away the key binding sites, it stops binding. It doesn't cork anymore. You don't see much effect. Take this one away, there's nothing. So these are really important for binding. They form the binding site. We found that in the language of medicinal chemistry, a druggable site inside this improbable protein. Turns out the cork does sit at the top. Here's a structure that we determined. And when you look from on top, it's we didn't think about this. We didn't think for a moment. It turns out that the cork that has eight sugars, so to the chemist, the C8 axis of symmetry, it fits perfectly into this homo optimum. The protein has C8 symmetry, the cork has C8 symmetry. We didn't even think about that. That just turned out to be the one that works. But look, it fits almost perfectly into the diameter. It's a spooky. So does it work? We block things and we can various different ways. We can look at the display of capsular polysaccharide on the surface through staining. And what we see is capsular polysaccharide in a dose response curve goes down. Reasonable constants for that. We see a doubling in the amount of LPS, this middle layer that we want the immune system to see. Antibodies can get into that and they can attack. And when we look at things like this, this is a killing assay where we take culture and there's a lot of information we're going to pick on certain aspects. If we take a normal bug, and we treat it with normal human serum, it has very little effect. Remember that hairy layer protects it. But if we take varying concentrations of our stuff, we go down to levels where we see almost complete killing. So the cork goes in, exposes the surface, and your blood to a system called complement can kill this stuff. And what's really interesting is that the cork is not a real antibiotic. It's not bacteriostatic, it's not bactericidal. On its own, it does diddly. It means your blood. So it's a synergistic antibody. And therefore, that gives us real hope that this might be resistant to all sorts of forms of um, classical resistance mechanisms. Because the bugs aren't threatened by it, right? They're only going to be threatened by it when your blood is around. And by then, it's too late. Turns out that this binding site is found in you know, quite a large number of pathogenic strains of bacteria, E. coli, Klebsiella. Many of these are so called escape bacteria that are the real threats that people worry about. Cork in a bottle, um, slightly odd idea. So, for the last 15 minutes, I'm going to change tack quite dramatically and talk about inflammation and cells and what a cell is. And some of this is semi philosophical. But a lot of it is based on an idea of what sugars might be doing in the body. We don't know the answer to this, but they are clearly complex. They store more information, site for site, than any other molecule in biology. And they have all sorts of variations. I'll show you why that is in a second. 
And one answer is that it might be nature's handshake. So sugar is on the surface of certain cells. This determines your blood groups, right? Um, that gives rise to um, different blood groups. It's all based on the sugars in your blood cells. That could be a kind of um, handshake interaction when we think about it. A hand reaches in and grabs hold of the sugar in a very selective way. The shape of the hand affects the difference. Uh, I wrote a review about this um, when I was at Durham. I had a fellowship at Durham before I started in Oxford. Um, and I wrote this general review, and um, I, uh, I'm a sad Smith fan, so I call it Hand in Glove. And then for some reason, the, the popular journal uh, described it as molecular Freemasonry. And that prompted, um, that prompted the weirdest email I've ever had in my entire life. Uh, and, uh, and it's this. Right? So after it was published, I got this email. <laughs> Super weird. And the best thing about it, it starts off, um, I won't say who it's from, but it starts off, I understand that you are a member of the craft. What is that? <laughs> turns out when you speak to people, that's what people refer to as Freemasonry. This came out of absolutely nowhere. And I then got invited to the university's lodge. Turns out that Durham University has a lodge, uh, has some Freemasonry. I didn't go, I didn't reply, I didn't become a Freemason. Which that might explain a lot of the grief I get at Oxford. <laughs> I should have become a Freemason, life would have been easier. But, uh, so there you go, very, very odd. So that's what can happen. So, a treasured email. So what do I mean by a handshake? Well, there are non covert interactions of protein and side chains, potentially, with the hydroxyl groups, hydrogen bonding to the chemist and the audience. And those hydrogen bonds can be arranged with absolute precision because of all the different so-called stereogenic centers, the ups and downs that you find in sugars. And there are lots of these ups and downs, density and information. And that means if you change just one, so you can see that, this is a crystal structure, this thing is binding, a kind of superficial type of handshake. It's shallow, weak, but it's precise. And if you change just one, so if we take this hydroxyl group down here, and we shift this one down here, it loses all binding. You don't need to lose much of this Velcro-like interaction to lose the whole thing. And we think that might be how sugars can be weak, but selective. And so it ends up being a sort of, excuse some of the puns, sweet talk between cells, the form of communication language. So why would you put sugars? Well, if you like, this dates me. Some of you, most of you probably won't even know who study the um, But um, DNA bases have a very limited repertoire, a very limited vocabulary, if you will, um, four words. And so that's where we store information, but it's limited. That probably is because this was the first source of information. When we look at proteins, we have um, 20, I should explain, Stig of the Dump was a, a caveman who lived in a rubbish dump, which most kids my age read about. I don't know why he lived in a rubbish dump. We used to read it at school, anyway. <coughs> it was good when it was um, uh, The side chains of proteins give more diversity, so you have more permutations. But these are all linear polymers, and so you don't get very much diversity. But in a sugar, you've got all of these ups and downs, you've got all these linkages that you've seen today, and the permutations become crazy, very, very quickly. I can show you that, but if we just take six nucleotides, six pieces of DNA put together, just over 4,000 permutations. Amino acids, 10 to 7. So over a million, right? 60 odd million. But if you take sugar, six sugars, bang. We're getting to the point where, as people tend to say, there aren't enough molecules in the universe, but it's far too many for us to make them all. Just from six. Just the hexasaccharide, right? And that's kind of speaking. We have way more complex structures in biology. So there's a huge amount of information in there. So how can we exploit that information? I'm going to tell you a little bit about that in a project today. And we use that information to build an artificial cell and to put information into that cell. So why do we need information in the cell? So this comes back to stuff that for me relates to Alan Turing, and I'll explain why. Turing didn't really think about life. But he did think about intelligence, and he got frustrated in a way that I got frustrated a number of years ago, and it was Turing's solution to that that helped me kind of think, yeah, this is how we can go forward. So there is an area of science called synthetic biology where people are trying to make and understand cells. And one aspect of that is to build a cell from scratch, various different ways, knock out genes, build it from its typical building blocks, and that's what we were thinking about. We want to make a cell from the raw components. So what raw components would you need for a cell? So people have thought about this for decades. Some really interesting people out on their own, incredible Hungarian called Tibor Ganti, who thought about this for 40 years, came up with all the thermodynamics for cells, a book that was largely ignored. If someone wants an interesting read, this is amazing. 
Um, an incredible Italian uh, chemist called Luigi Luisi, thinking about how you can build cells. So what would you need for a minimal cell? I mean, that's a mad question, almost unanswerable. But one of the things that we think you need, and these are the three that we've picked, and we debate this often, is you think you need a metabolism, okay? Um, the thing's got to live, it's got to keep going. One of the hallmarks of cellularity, of life, is that it's not an equilibrium. It's a classic cliche. If you're an equilibrium, you're dead, basically. And so life is far from equilibrium. Controlled by kinetics. You need fuel to stay far, uh, stay far from equilibrium. And that's metabolism, okay? And then you need to try and maintain that difference, that chemical potential difference. And often that's easily done through a box or a gradient. A box is a little way of doing it. So you need a compartment. And then you kind of need a purpose. And people often say, well, what's the reason for life, reproduction, etc. I think reproduction is just a hallmark of life, not a purpose. The real purpose probably for life is to transmit information. I mean, there's no thing transmitting information, but that's what's going on. In complex information. So for me, a cell is metabolism, box, and information. So, some people try and make this by ripping out genes, making animal cells. Some people try and build it up from a box made of lipids and acids. Existing components. There have been some really interesting ideas. Um, so, this is what we want to try and make. So, one way, a guy called Luigi Luisi, has made really simple things based on fatty acid esters and shown that they are cell like. And you kind of look at this, this is a, a system where the box is kind of self replicating through a very simple hydrolysis reaction. It's really simple. Uh, a Nobel Prize winner in the US, a guy called Jack Shostak, has tried to make unnatural. Uh, nucleotides and feed those into lipids, boxes, and see what they do, and they kind of swell out and do so. And these are very prominent papers and you know, important journals. But when you look at this as a chemist, you kind of go, what? It's, like a, it's a lipid box. How is that alive? How is that a cell? People get very angry at the conferences I go to. Why is that cell? And why is it alive? And so forth. Uh, and so you end up with these conversations that are frustrating. And when you get into stuff like this, it's almost probably semantics, right? You're probably going to have to agree to disagree. So what's that got to do with Turing? Well, Turing reached a similar point in his career. Some of you might know this, but um, the so-called Turing test was born out of frustrations. Uh, and those frustrations included a number of questions that came from the community uh, that Turing was in at the time, in the 1950s. <coughs> People kept asking things like, can machines think? Can I make the computers? Da -da 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 -da. And one of the questions he really hated was, um, can machine said, you can see that from this statement, I believe to be too meaningless to deserve discussion. <laughs> so he's basically saying, stop being obsessed with something you can't answer. And so his solution was to come up with something that he referred to as the imitation game, where he said, let's not worry about what it is, let's see if we can give it a test that's relevant that it can pass. Many of you all know the imitation game is based on interrogation. Um, if you have an artificial intelligence, you can tell it that artificial intelligence passes the Turing test because you can't tell the difference between the artificial intelligence and the natural intelligence when an interrogator talks to it in a form of communication. Turing specified English as the as being the language that's used in a very old-fashioned style. So we thought, well, if you're going to worry about what a cell is, don't worry about whether it is a cell based on its properties. Give it a test, very similarly, and one based, in this case, also on communication. So can we create a system where we have an interrogator cell in the presence of natural cells and an artificial cell, a chemical cell that we call a cell, and a bad pun, and see if it will talk. Can we set up something that will be an interrogation? We've, we've got there, it, it turns out we've got something that, that comes close to that, but I'm going to tell you about how we developed a language for the cell and how we got it to speak that language. And then we could think about all sorts of emergent properties for this. So we need C, M, and I. And the first thing we started with is metabolism. So we're going to take metabolism, stick it into this box or compartment. And the metabolism that we chose is one of the most remarkable reactions in chemistry. People hardly ever heard about this. Uh, very rarely taught in undergraduate courses. This is called the form of reaction, partly because it's so mad and we don't really understand it. And we want to use that to create an information. So, the foremost reaction, and this is the reaction that we studied, goes back to the 1860s, discovered by a guy called Butteroff. And um, it's simple chemistry, for those of you who know the chemistry. You take a very simple unit called formaldehyde, and then you take a slightly more complex, but not much more complex, unit called glycoaldehyde, and then you perform what is known as an aldol reaction, which is catalyzed by a base, and actually requires a base, and that leads to a carbon-carbon bond, and you can go on in a cycle. 
My summarization then gives you a longer chain. And then this intermediate, the four carbon unit, can then undergo a reverse reaction called a retro angle, and it spits out a copy of this and another copy of this. So one becomes two, becomes four, and so on. And this is the only example of a truly autocatalytic reaction in science that works in water. It's the only example, right? It's one of the holy grails of science in several techniques. There's one other that works in obscure organic solids. It's the only thing we've known about it for over 150 years. We have ever done. So, autocatalysis, true autocatalysis. And it takes place in the presence of calcium and base, alkaline. And it needs calcium, it also works for lead, it doesn't work for any other metal, divalency. And so from that we can get more complex sugars. And so we have this incredible system, and it makes sugars. And it raises all sorts of questions about origin of life and where they come from. Um, incredible. People have seen products of this on meteorites, asteroids, and so can we put this in a box and get it to work? Could that be our metabolism? It's making complex stuff, it's making this language. Can we create low pH, the alkali that we need in the box, can we put calcium inside the box? Calcium hydroxide is insoluble, so how do you put that inside a liquid box and a liquid box? And now in the end we get it out, those are all the questions that we bring to the face. So we take the reaction outside of a box, in bulk, it makes this. Lots of stuff. Hundreds, sometimes thousands of sugars, all of this information, this language, in a rough ratio of 4 carbon to 5 carbon to 6 to 7, here of 20, 20, 40, 20, in bulk, better than mine. It's a collection of not only alkyl reactions, but Canizaro, and so called Long de Brunbach, Ekenstein rearrangement, all of this mad stuff going on. All just calcium, hydroxide, and aldehyde, formaldehyde. So we're going to make the box from it. It needs to be stable to calcium and lead, lots of formaldehyde, and high pH. And we tested lots of liquids during this a few, and it turns out that one works really well. We can show that it's stable over time. We make a box that sits there like a lipid droplet, waiting. We can put stuff inside it that shows us that you can put high concentrations of formaldehyde inside the box. You can even see that in movies. These are fluorescent labeled systems moving around. These are boxes. They're under Brownian motion. We can put calcium inside. The way we did this was to put calcium chloride in, and then we can change the pH. And we put it all together, and what happens? So, when we put the calcium and the formaldehyde, we change the pH, protons can go through the box, other stuff can't, we see something. And what we see is really interesting. In bulk, remember, it was 20, 20, 40, 20, but here, inside the box, is it volume, is it shape? We don't know. We see much more of C5 sugars, we change the distribution, we can identify them. We're making sugars inside our chin. It's doing something. So what are we going to do with this? Um, we've got a metabolism, can we get this out? And how will we even be able to understand this language? What's the information? And the clue to that, and I love this because normally on in micro microscopic plots, this isn't a mistake, this is kilometers. Uh, this is an example of luminescence, and normally it's in micrometers or nanometers. But this is an example of bioluminescence, and this is the answer to how we understand the language. So this is off the coast of Somalia, this comes from a uh, a satellite image actually was published in PNS in 2005, but people have known about this for hundreds of years in this wonderfully named journal, Proceedings of the Bombay Geographical Society. Um, bioluminescence from mass of bacteria sitting in the sea. And one bacteria in particular called Vibrio harvia. It gets together, and when it gets together, not alone, it glows. You can see that glowing from space. Bioluminescence. And this is how we talk to the bug. How do we do that? Well, it turns out that these bugs, when they get together, they excrete sugars. They use sugars for talking. <coughs> and if one receives this sugar-like molecule, it starts to glow, if the concentration is high enough. So when they get really close together, boom, you get this switch on with bioluminescence in the presence of a language. It responds to language. Natural bugs can understand sugars. They can translate it, almost like our test. So this is a natural thing. We don't make this in very high quantity of our system. But we do make a whole load of things that look like it. Could these work? And it turns out, to cut one story short, the answer is yes. Many of these are interpreted by the bug. Very crude language, but they can hear it. So can we get this out into the natural bug, which has this genetic system that responds, can understand it, the real hard eye, and then can we get it to see, can we, can we see that it responds in the way that it glows? Can we see stuff like this? So how do we get it out? 
first way we got it out was to set it off and then just smash it up with detergent. Um, pretty brutal, not good for the gel, in fact not good for the natural cells that are next door. But before the natural cells die, having killed the artificial cell, we saw a response. So we kind of were hopeful. This thing can recognize it. Then we thought, can we get it out in a more subtle way? Can we punch a hole in it? We use the protein that has been well used by collaborator Hayden Bailey, which nicely punches a hole in the lipid layers and just creates a little tube. And out of that little tube came sugar, and that little tube allowed language to come out, and we see the same effect. So we can put natural cells next to artificial cells, and the artificial cells talk to the natural cells, and they respond as though they're next to other natural cells. And so it's the first part of this idea. This may be a bit hard to see, but what we have here is our shell. We have a positive control, we have a negative control. And hopefully over time you can see them grow. They're in the presence. We've got the shells there as well. And you can see this vague glow. It's a bit hard to see. Nothing in the middle over time. But you can see this glowing on the plate. You can measure it um, using a spectrophotometer. So, we started this conversation and we've very recently started to be able to get talk back from the boat to be able to control something. So I'm going to finish by showing you a very short video, uh, and, uh, and uh, this was a video made by an artist, uh, synthetic biologist, paid for by one of the research councils when we were doing this work originally, and he came and watched what we did, and he made this video based on an idea of what might happen if we had artificial cells that would be under the control of us and industry and so forth, so what could shells be useful? So this is all like, um, it's, a, a doc, it's, it's like a pseudo-documentary written on a history of a timeline that hasn't yet happened, a million happened, based on this idea, and it's kind of cool, a guy called James King, so I'll play that to you. For over 200 years, the compressed tablet has been the preferred way of introducing medicine into the body. But when the tablet was replaced by the chemical cell, medicine changed, and so did our understanding of living things. The first true chemical cell approved for use in the healthcare industry is a simple construction. It is manufactured by forming an inorganic membrane around particles of a given drug compound. Only under specific conditions does the membrane become porous, releasing small amounts of the drug where it is required. Advances in metabolic engineering led to the second generation of chemical cells. Lying dormant inside the patient for several weeks, they monitor the condition of their surroundings. When triggered, they are capable of manufacturing a specific drug, releasing it as and when it is required. The third generation of chemical cells are equipped with the autocatalytic machinery necessary to replicate themselves. Useful for treating chronic conditions, they maintain a constant population in a patient over extended periods of time. By reproducing in pairs, the fourth generation of chemical cells bear offspring that combine the metabolic processes of both their parents. Often used when a patient's condition does not respond to a known compound, these offspring will produce novel varieties of drugs, some of which might have a positive effect. The fifth and most recent generation of chemical cells are characterized by one important additional feature. If these cells determine that the drug they are producing is ineffective, then they make themselves the target of the patient's immune system, which will treat the cell like any other pathogen, killing it. This ability to die subjects the chemical cells to a form of natural selection, allowing their evolution towards a more effective treatment of the patient's condition. The medicines described here represent key milestones in the development of chemical cell therapeutics, but they are also the increments on a scale between non-living and living things, the cellularity scale. This is used in the pharmaceutical industry to classify chemical cells for regulatory purposes. But we prefer to see it as the root to a new tree of life, the branches of which will doubtless bear the fruits of our future health and well-being. Thank you again for the invitation. about stereochemistry actually. So mm -hmm. we know that when it comes to stereochemistry and chemicals, the difference can mean uh, a 
uh, a mutagen versus a therapeutic compound for morning sickness, for example, the infalidomide. How does serochemistry with endogenous compounds in carbohydrate, how important is that in the context of the three stories you talked about, for example, with uh, tuberculosis detection? Have you looked into the fact that serochemistry is also in shells? Yeah, so absolutely. I think one of the things is that um, the truth is that, that, that life is chiral and it uses handedness <coughs> all the time um, as a form of selection, as a form of interaction. So in the same way that we have to shake hands in the right way, um, shoes must fit, not socks, um, then uh, life uses that. right? And um, it's the same for all interactions, whether it be a ligand, um, thalidomide is the one that's often used. Actually, thalidomide probably wouldn't have, turns out it doesn't make a difference because those stereoisomers need to convert anyway. But it, clearly, the interaction makes a huge difference. Different enantiomers give rise to different smells, left and right handed, but even those that are just one stereogenic centre different, when they've got multiple stereogenic centres, like sugars. Um, it will make a difference. And I talked a little bit about that in the context of this handshake. So really what we have is a very similar process. That change one stereogenic centre, you lose an interaction. And therefore, a surface designed to bind in one shape no longer has something that can hold that bulge or that hydrogen bond in that shape. And so, if you like, um, stereogenicity and chirality is an extension of recognition in biomolecule binding the leaves and so forth. And that's used all over. And what's interesting is when you look at nature's use of chirality of shape, it can um, create shape upon shape. So you, have, you can have a chirality of the building blocks, but you can get chiral shapes from things that are themselves achiral. And nature exploits that idea as well. So the handedness of a hit is a form of chirality. Could be made up in principle from stuff that's um, not common. And so nature understands this idea because it's just part of evolution. It's just part of fitness. It gives it more information, more methods of selecting them from over and more cheap ways of being precise. I was like. also thinking if chirality could affect your specificity when it comes to uh, so they're the uh, systems or yeah. Absolutely. No, it really does. And so we've seen examples where so I didn't talk about this before. We made a chemical cell, and we kind of did what was number three in the video. So we basically used the metabolism in the presence of the drug target, and then we basically did crystal structures from the junk inside our chemical cell, and then the crystal structure showed three of only 4,000 possible compounds. So we just got the cell to make a load of weird stuff. So we started, so in a way, it starts to move towards that. And that then gave us a hit for, uh, in, in this case, a new antibiotic to take forward. So we kind of, and it was sugar dust. But absolutely, the, if you like, the target then selected the three of these unnatural sugars. So we, instead of having to have a chemist make thousands of compounds, we just got a gel to make it. And then select Well, we have time for a couple more questions. Yeah. Um, so, when chemists try to mimic biology, mm. um, do you think we will ever be able to reach the efficiency of biology? Because biological systems, for example, use a quantum effect very efficiently to boost the productivity in, for example, enzymes, which, which so far we are far from, from getting it. I think we need to be, that I, I, to answer your first part of your question, absolutely right. Um, I think the challenge of reaching levels of catalysis or efficiency that we see in biology, which is a product of thousands of years, is a huge one. Okay? So what we kind of do is understand the chemistry and then nature teaches its lessons in the chemistry. I mean, that's what we do in this group. Nature does stuff in beautiful ways that we never would have thought of. Thing. Obscure reactions like the SNI reaction, turns out we've discovered for years that they're all over biology. Why, why not? If you never looked for them because you thought they were hard, but nature could do them for a while. Quantum effects, um, contrary to the belief of some prominent uh, um, television scientists, are yet to be proven. Right? Tunneling effects, yes, but quantum biology does not yet exist. And, uh, I, I know Jim Ackley, but it's, yeah, some, someone has to do some more research for <laughs> so, <laughs> so, There are some of facts, there are, there, there are clearly things that we can't explain. People still argue about the coherence and photosynthesis. 
that's still controversial. Right? People still there are other ways of explaining it, migration effects. And rather than yeah, yeah and, and so there are still two so yeah, we, there is no one thing where we can say it's a quantum effect. But we're certainly in the regime where we can start thinking about it. As, as chemists, we know that quantum effects are there. I mean quantum effects are there in chemistry, right? But whether there whether there is a quantum biology, I still think it's an open question. It's an interesting one, but it, it's not a yes. Uh, more of a general question. Mm. There's three very different interesting stories there. Uh, but have you done work on all of those three in the lab during different periods, or is it simultaneous? How does that work? Because oh, yeah, in terms of how we run the group and stuff. So, so, um, so actually, the way. Uh, it's, so there was a bit of overlap with some of those students. The first, um, so Kerry did her work around about 2012-ish. Um, Paul's work was slightly earlier in terms of the chemical cell. And then the stuff we did with uh, Ling Bing was come 2013 to 2016, so later. But um, you can see in my mind the kind of chronology is relevant, basically. If you think of an idea, and you start it. And I tend to design projects in a group where you know, I sit down with a graduate student and say, let's try and do this. And then it becomes that graduate student's journey with some advice from you. <laughs> so in a sense, they, I, I, like, I think it's important that people get, um, they get to work on a, on a thing. And I think people underestimate this. There's an aesthetic to science, which is important. You don't want to just be part of a team, right? If you, are, if you were painting something, You'd want to paint that thing. You want someone. I'll, I'll do the top right whilst we're doing the bottom left. But, and often science is done in gangs now, and that can be very efficient. But some of the aesthetic and creativity and discovery gets lost. And for the individual, knowing it's yours, whether it's a bad painting or not, I think that's an important motivator for people. So I tend to work like that. Sometimes it means it's a bit slower. People say, why don't you put five people on this? Because it's not theirs. It belongs to the person I'm credited. But um, that's the way I tend to work. But not every group does that, actually, to be honest. Probably less common in science now. Okay. Um, so, if anyone else has any more questions, please feel free to continue that during dinner with the speaker afterwards. Uh, if you haven't signed up for dinner but are interested, feel free to uh, find one of our committee members, Lee Tong, right there, Christina, or myself. And uh, yeah, and thank you everyone very much once again.